part two tales of english minsters hereford by elizabeth grierson this librivox recording is in the public domain part two at the very moment that this wicked scheme was being arranged the two kings and their trains had met and after greeting one another courteously they all came riding with great joy home to the castle the black-hearted queen went out to meet them but her fair young daughter princess elfrida was not with her she was too shy and modest to greet her lover in public so she had crept up alone to the top of the castle and stood there peering over the battlements to see what manner of man he had become for it was not the first time that they had met they had been playmates in their youth when ethelbert as etheling had visited sutton with his father and they had thought much of each other ever since and it chanced that ethelbert glanced up at the battlements and when he saw the maiden with her flaxen locks and blue eyes looking down at him his heart leaped for joy and as soon as he had greeted the queen and quaffed a cup of mead he made his way up to where she was and there they sat together so the old books tell us all the sunny afternoon while the rest of the gallant company king offa and prince Edgriff, and all the knights and nobles went a-hunting the wild wolves in the forest near by and as they sat they talked together and ethelbert told the princess how all the people of east anglia were looking forward to welcome their young queen and both of them being true christians they made a solemn vow that they would rule their land in righteousness and the fear of god even as king ethelbert of kent and berthia his wife had ruled their kingdom that night a great feast was held in the palace of sutton a feast more magnificent and gorgeous than had ever been held there before king offa sat at the head of the table wearing his royal robes and the golden crown of mercia on his head beside him sat his wife and close by were the youthful bride and bridegroom and that noble youth Erkfrith, as the old chroniclers called him nobles and thanes and aldermen crowded round the board and gleemen who sang fierce war-songs of hengrist and of cedric and arthur and his knights and the red wine was poured out and they drank long and heartily more heartily perhaps than they ought to have done for the queen made kimbert who stood behind the king's chair fill his cup again and again with strong fierce wine which had been a present from the frankish king and when his brain was heated and he was not master of himself she leant against him and whispered in his ear and the poor half-drunken monarch muttered that she could do as she would little recking that from that time the glory would depart from his house then she spoke lightly and gaily to her guest handing him a golden cup filled with wine as she did so now must thou drink to us fair sir and to thy bride even as we have drunk success and long life to thee and the young king took it gladly and drank the blood-red draught little dreaming that it had been drugged by the cruel hand that gave it to him but so it was and soon feeling drowsy he retired to his chamber and dismissing his attendants threw himself all undressed on the couch and fell into a heavy slumber you know the rest of the sad story how the trap-door fell and the couch fell with it and how kimbert the warden either smothered him with the silken cushion among which he was lying or what is more likely cut off his head with his own sword for the tale is told either way when the cruel deed was done the warden and the servants who were with him took the lifeless body and carried it out secretly by the postern and at first thought of throwing it into the river but remembering that the queen had ordered it to be buried kimbert made the others dig a great hole into which they flung it and such was the wildness and lawlessness of the time when they had covered it up and stamped down the earth upon it they thought that the whole matter was ended that was a very great mistake however for although the deed was done there were many many consequences to follow it was as when a stone is thrown into the midst of a pond 
the stone may sink but in sinking it makes ripples which go on widening and widening until they cover the whole surface of the water of course the murder could not be hidden for on the very next morning the east anglian thanes and noblemen demanded to know what had become of their master and when they discovered the fate that had befallen him they made haste to flee in case they too should be murdered then the next thing that happened was that princess elfrida the poor broken-hearted young bride felt so shocked and terrified at the thought that her own father had allowed the man she was about to marry to be put to death in such a treacherous manner that she was afraid to live at home any longer so she slipped out of the palace accompanied by one or two trusty servants and fled to a monastery at crowland in the Venn country where she became a nun perhaps that was the first thing that made king offa's conscience begin to prick but like king ahab he tried to brazen the thing out saying to himself the deed is done and i cannot undo it so i may as well have the kingdom so he sent an army to east anglia and took possession of it but i think that all the time he must have been feeling more and more unhappy for remember at heart he was a good man and had lived up to this time a noble and honourable life and a certain terror must have fallen upon him when two months later his wife Crendeda died and sitting by his desolate hearth he remembered the old story of the king of israel who had done as he had done and on whom the wrath of god had so speedily fallen it must have been almost a relief when one day edrith the bishop of lichfield came to him and said what is this that thou hast done killed a defenceless man in thy own palace and taking possession of his kingdom hadst thou killed him in open battle no one would have blamed thee but to murder him in secret when he came as a friend was not worthy of thee o king i know it i know it replied offa who was now thoroughly sorry for his deed but it was the wine which i drank which my wife gave to me it inflamed my brain so that i knew not what i said now at that time people had the idea that they could atone for any wicked act that they had done by giving money or lands to the church or going on some pilgrimage so edwulf told king offa that he thought that first of all he had better see that king ethelbert's body had christian burial you remember it had just been thrown into a hole and that after that he must go a pilgrimage to rome and tell the pope the whole story and do whatever he told him to do as a punishment then he added some words which were very solemn but which turned out only too true this was what he said because thou hast repented of thy evil deed thy sin will be forgiven nevertheless the sword shall not depart from thine own house it was in thine heart that mercia should be the greatest of english kingdoms and so it might have been but now the glory shall depart from thee and another king even the king of wessex shall be greater in power and shall become the first king of the whole of england offa did as he was bid he had the body of the young king taken from its rude grave and buried in the little church of reeds and wattles at fernlega near which ethelbert had sat and mused on the night before his death then he went to rome and told the whole story to the pope and said how penitent he was and how gladly he would do anything in his power to atone for his sin and the pope who wanted to have more churches built in england told him to go home again and show his sorrow by building a really fine church at st albans where the first english martyr alban laid down his life for the faith and another at fernlega where there was only the plain little cathedral church of wood offa promised that he would do these things and when he returned to england he gave orders that the two buildings should be begun without delay very soon afterwards he died and it fell to the lot of one of his viceroys whose name was milfred to carry out his plans at fernlega and to build an admirable stone church there and so king offa vanishes from history and although we cannot doubt that his penitence was very deep 
and that his great sin was forgiven it is very striking to read how bishop edwell's words were fulfilled and how the glory did indeed depart from his house we have seen how his wife died and how his youngest and fairest daughter became a nun then he himself died and was buried not in either of the two great minsters which he had caused to be erected but in a little chapel on the banks of the ouse near bedford one day a dreadful flood came and the ouse overflowed its banks and washed away the chapel and king offa's bones along with it and no one ever knew what became of them soon afterwards his only son prince ecgriff died and slowly the kingdom of mercia grew less and less important and the little kingdom of wessex grew greater and greater until its king king ecbert great-grandfather of alfred the great became overlord of the whole of england as for king offa's eldest daughter edberg her story is the saddest of all for she was a wicked woman like her mother and she did one bad thing after another until at last she had neither money nor friends left and the old chroniclers tell us that in the days of alfred who reigned over the west saxons and who was overlord of all the kingdom of england there were many men yet living who had seen edberg daughter of offa and wife of betric begging her bread but it is pleasant to think that if edwulf's words came true in such a terrible way the dream or vision which poor king ethelbert had on the last night of his life came true also but in a much happier and sweeter manner for as i have said under the direction of milfred king offa's viceroy a noble stone church replaced the little wooden one at fernlega or as it soon began to be called hereford which means the ford of the army because when the mercian soldiers wish to pass into wales they cross the river wye at this point this new church was dedicated to st ethelbert and the blessed virgin and into it when it was finished the bishop's chair was carried for although the young king could not be called a martyr he certainly left a record of a pure and brave and noble life behind him and it seemed fitting and we are glad that it did so that the memory of his name should linger all down the ages round the stately cathedral which was built as an expiation of his death and in which for half a century at least his body rested it was not taken into the new cathedral at once however which seems rather curious but it was left for more than a hundred years in the grave in which it had been laid by offa before he went on his pilgrimage to rome perhaps this was because there was constant fighting going on all these years between the people of mercia and the welsh and hereford being just on the border of the two kingdoms was so constantly exposed to the danger of being raided or looted or burned down that no one had any time to think about anything else but at last there came a period of peace and the bishop of hereford who was living then whose name was ethelstan determined that he would restore the cathedral which had got badly knocked about in these old border quarrels when he had done so he took king ethelbert's bones from their humble resting-place and had them brought into his newly restored church and placed in a gorgeous shrine which he had prepared for their reception a great misfortune fell upon this good bishop for for the last thirteen years of his life he was blind and i have no doubt that during all the long period when he could not see it must have been a great joy to him to think as he was led out and into the service that he had been allowed before the darkness fell on him to repair the house of god and to provide a fitting tomb for the royal youth in whose memory it had been erected alas he little knew what a few short years were to bring and we almost wish that the poor man had died before his life work was all undone for in ten fifty six a quarrel took place between elfgar earl of chester and edward the confessor who was king of england at that time i do not know what the quarrel was about but at any rate elfgar was summoned to appear before the witan or parliament in london on a charge of high treason 
his guilt was not proved but the king was so angry with him that he made him an outlaw which was of course very unjust elfgar as was to be expected in these old warlike days determined to have his revenge so he went and hired the services of a band of danish pirates who chanced to be cruising about in their ships round the coast of ireland then he went to griffith king of north wales who was his friend and neighbour and asked him if he would help him also griffith agreed readily for he hated the english and soon a fleet of danish ships came sailing up the severn full of fierce pirates and wild welshmen all of whom were sworn to obey elfgar and griffith they came to the west country because they knew there were a great many rich churches there that they could plunder and as soon as the river became too shallow for their ships they disembarked and marched in the direction of hereford now as perhaps you know edward the confessor was very fond of the normans and he had made one of his favourites a norman noble named ralph earl of hereford this ralph was a brave man and quite ready to lead the citizens and the people of the neighbourhood out against the lawless invaders but he made one great mistake it was the custom in his own land for all the gentlemen to fight on horseback instead of on foot as was the way of the anglo-saxons and he insisted on his followers following the foreign fashion setting the example himself with the result that every one felt awkward and embarrassed and very soon it became evident that elfgar and his friends were going to have the best of it seeing this earl ralph lost his head and ran away and perhaps we cannot wonder that the simple country folk followed his example although alas one or two hundred of them were overtaken and killed before they had gone very far then the victorious horde of savages for they were little else swept on straight to the cathedral where they knew that the holy vessels at least and the ornaments on the altar would be of gold or silver but if they thought that they could obtain these easily they were mistaken for they had not reckoned on the kind of men with whom they had to deal for the brave priests determined to defend their church to the last and shut and barricaded the doors in their faces and although at last they were overcome and the church looted it was not until seven of their number lay dead in the great western doorway a scene of wild confusion followed and when the wild invaders marched away again there was nothing left of the little city or of the great church which athelstan had restored with so much labour and pride but a few smouldering ruins among other things king ethelbert's shrine was destroyed and although we hope that his bones were taken care of and buried somewhere else in the church or else burned up altogether we cannot tell for certain what became of them now if there is one thing which we admire more than another about the grand old builders of the middle ages it is their perseverance they would spend a hundred years over the planning and building of a church when one man died another taking his place and when as happened here and many times elsewhere the church was destroyed either by accident or design they lost no time in useless lamentations but just patiently began to build it up again trusting that in the future a time would come when their work would be prized and taken care of as it deserved to be so we find that in a very few years the work was begun once more from the beginning this time by a norman bishop named robert de losinga and we are glad to know that his work remains for if we go into the cathedral we can see part of it still standing for it was under his directions that parts of the choir and of the south transept were built that was more than eight hundred years ago then followed the building of the nave the lady chapel the north transept and the tower until some four hundred years after bishop losinga had begun it the great church was completed and stood much as it stands to-day except that a wooden spire surmounted the square tower of stone this spire was taken down in seventeen ninety end of part two